We are really pleased to welcome a special guest and an amazing entrepreneur, philanthropist, founder and CEO of Five Hour Energy, Manoj Bhargava, with us this evening. Hi, folks. Usually, everybody asks me the same question first, so I'll probably try to get to that first so that we can kind of move past it, which is, how did you start this thing? And what made you want to start this thing? What happened is, we, I had a company that I retired from, and uh, then I found out that retirement was harder work than working. So I went back and I said, okay, if, if I uh, start a company, if I don't have a technology that I'm working by the hour, so I said, okay, I gotta find some technology. And then technology hopefully gives you residual income. So there's only two ways to get technology, to invent it or to find it. Inventing has about the same chance as uh, you know, a lottery ticket. So we formed a company that looked for technology worldwide. We got, and I liked chemistry because I thought it was a really simple thing. You, you mix a bunch of cheap stuff together and sell it for more. Uh, that's basically chemistry. Since I'm not that educated, that's, that's my understanding of it anyway. Uh, so we had submissions from uh, thousands of PhDs across the world. And actually people started hiring us, large companies started hiring us and saying, okay, can you find technology for us? So we found out, of course, the large companies, all they did was have committee meetings. They would actually never get anything done. So I dropped those contracts and we found, uh, short of it is, I found this technology at a trade show. Um, we I went there and somebody introduced us to this company and we said, uh, you know, I had a meeting with them and at about two o'clock in the afternoon I thought, oh my goodness, I got eight hours of meetings and I'm not making it. I'm not gonna get, be able to get through it. So I went back to them and I said, didn't you have some energy, something, could I try that? So they gave me this thing and I said, whoa, this I can sell. Uh, so for the seven, eight hours I was just, it was, it was really great. So I said, okay, I'll figure it out. So I went back to them and they were science guys and I'm just a lowly business guy. So they really didn't talk to me and just get lost kid. So I said, okay, I don't have a whole lot of respect for most science guys anyway, because I think uh, they don't really do that much as just hide behind uh, big words. So I said, all right, I'll figure it out. It can't be that hard. So fortunately it took me about 30 days, um, figured it out. And what I did was instead of a large drink, I made it a small one. The reason is a few things. One, I thought, you know, why is somebody tired and thirsty at the same time? That doesn't make any sense. So why not make it small? And the other thing is, from the retail level, it was, do I have a big bottle and compete against Coke and Pepsi for cooler space? That sounded really dumb. So I said, okay, let's not do that. If I make it small and I'm in the front of the, of the counter, I'm competing against keychains and batteries, which I can handle that. So we made it small. We made it actually, the first one was one ounce. Unfortunately, we couldn't read it. So we made it two ounces. Uh, so we, we, uh, we got it out there. I thought, okay, let me find out if this thing has legs. So we put it in uh, 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 the largest vitamin store. Uh, they have about over 1,000 stores. Uh, and the first week it sold 200 bottles, which wasn't very good. And so I said, okay, let me just leave it there. I'm not gonna advertise, not do anything. And within six months, at the sixth month, it was selling 10,000 a week, which for that store, that was amazing. So I said, okay, now we know this thing has legs. So then we went out, and of course, I had no experience in consumer products. Uh, all we were armed with was uh, common sense and, hey, we can do this. This is not, this is not a big deal, which is, this kind of thinking is, of course, very familiar in this neck of the woods. So we started with uh, what are called trunk slammers. We guys with, in the back of their car, they'll throw stuff in. They go from store to store peddling stuff. We started there, then we got into drugstores, then we got into Walmart, and now we have uh, four, SK, four different items at checkout at every Walmart 
checkout, which is the most uh, difficult space in the world to get. Um, and we became one of the largest consumer products in the world. We are the lar largest dietary, dietary supplement brand in the world. And really, all of it was just common sense stuff. It wasn't anything. People would say, oh my god, how did you do it? It's amazing. I tell people, look, we, we, we weren't that smart. The only thing we did was we just didn't do dumb stuff. Uh, it, and that really differentiated us from pretty much all corporations. Uh, so. <laughs> So I mean, even to this day, people say, how many people do you have? Uh, I say, well, you know, in our offices, and including marketing, sales, uh, accounting, everything all together, we have 65 people, OK? Not including our plant, which has 250, which is run as a separate company. And they say, wow, you must be really efficient. I said, no, no, we're not efficient at all, to tell you the truth. We just don't do useless stuff. Uh, <laughs> You know, so all I did was cut out everything that uh, didn't make money, or didn't improve the product, didn't make the customer happy. It's got to go. And doing that, you get rid of like hundreds and hundreds of potential. You know, we don't do strategic initiatives, and you know, <laughs> I can't even spell that stuff. You know, so it, it, it was very different than what uh, you know. We, we stayed out of jargon, partly because I'm not, I'm not familiar with all the MBA stuff. But you know, there's, there's so much jargon, I, I, and I can't spell most of it. Um, and I think the people that use it also don't understand it. Uh, but they have to use it. I mean, how many times have you got on a resume and every second line there's strategic? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, we just did it differently. We said, no, no, just use common sense and, and just go. And do it now. You know, uh, to give you examples, we don't have, our meetings last, uh, most of the meetings last about a minute or two. <laughs> because most of the time, it's, it's, it's like a decision of saying, I'm on the roof, should I take the stairs or the fast way down? <laughs> you know, it's really not a decision. And yet, they'll schedule a half hour, an hour meeting with 18 people. <laughs> should we jump off the roof or take the stairs? <laughs> most of the time, at least the people we have would rather take the stairs. So we, we uh, did really, really simple stuff. And, and our whole job is to make, it, make the business really simple. Uh, and you know, it, it usually flies in the face of all experts. Experts do not like simple. Uh, so there's lots of stuff we did that was completely different. And it turned into you know, one of the largest brands in the world. And then, uh, then I thought, OK, this is really big, and we're making you know, ridiculous amounts of money, what do I do with this thing? So um, actually what happened much later is that, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation contacted me to be, be one of their uh, uh, giving pledge.org or something, whatever. So they said, write me a letter as to why, do you, why, why, do you, why are you giving away 90% of your money? So I mean, I jotted down something in 10 minutes, I wrote it to them, and they were all like, okay, this is the best letter. Because what I said was, I have two choices. You know, I can wreck my son's life, or I can give it away. <laughs> uh, so do really stupid stuff, or do not stupid stuff. You know? So we kind of went this way and said, OK, let's not do dumb stuff. So today, we are the largest charity in India that nobody knows. Uh, we affect. <laughs> Yeah. The other guys are nice guys. I'm not saying that they're not nice guys, but they tend to do more announcements than they do work. Uh, you know, we, I have a simple benchmark, and, and uh, I mean, people have, we don't have, you know, big fancy, how do you gauge whether you did well or not? We, we don't do that. I so say the only thing we look for is how many people that are underprivileged did we significantly affect? That's it. Because you really don't know, sitting behind a desk in fancy air-conditioned office, what they need out there. One guy, I remember, when I went to this meeting of these big shots, you know, billionaire types. With, and then one guy says, well, how should we do this so that it's sustainable? So I get a little annoyed, and I said, it's not about you. you know, it's about them. 
If you have a business, it's about the customer. In the same way, you go out to the field and you find out what do they need and then do that. Don't sit here and say, okay, a guy's starving over there. I think you should get an education. You know, I'm going to be dead tomorrow, but great, I'll have an education. Uh, so uh, people don't really understand what to do there. So what we did, I'll give you an example of something we could never have come up with. There's an area in Bengal area that uh, it's on the river, and there's 150,000 people that live on the river. So we have several boats that are clinics, and they travel from village to village constantly and serve that community of 150,000. Now, who could have come up with that? I mean, you had to be out there and recognize the need and then do it. So what we did, because we really, you know, m most things I really don't know what I'm doing. So in the same thing I realized in the charity that also I didn't know what I was doing. So I said, okay, if I don't know what I'm doing, why don't I find people who do know what they're doing? So what we do is we fund other charities that are good guys. So our job is we find guys that, have done, that are doing really good work and say, we'll adopt you. You don't have to worry about funding from here on. We'll adopt you. And in India, there are amazingly good people. There are amazingly bad people there also. But there are really, really amazing people that sacrifice so much. And all we do is say, OK, we'll adopt you. Sometimes they say, well, you know, we're running a school of the blind. Would you take it? And, and we're looking at it, are you kidding? We don't, want <laughs> we don't want this. You run it. We'll just support you. So that's the charity side of it. Some of the other projects I'm involved with um, are going to be some of the largest projects we believe in the world. Uh, one is the biggest problem in the world that is not very, you know, not fashionable is water. Uh, and I, from, from what I've seen, not, not too many people are seriously doing work in that area. There's some work going on, but it doesn't seem very serious to me. So we already have a working prototype to, uh, uh, to turn salt water into fresh water. That is going to, and I've put together a skunk works, sort of a uh, you know, group of people that actually make stuff. You know, I hate to tell you, I'm sort of not much with engineers that sit in front of a, not, I mean, not the software guys, and you know, that's fine. But in the mechanical and whatever, in that side, you know, guys sit in front of computers and there's hundreds of them. You know, one time we had a meeting with the automotive guys and they, we were involved in this project. And I said, look, I, I, guys, I don't get it. You have 6,000 engineers and I, and I open the hood next year and it looks the same. <laughs> What'd you do? You know. So, you know, to me it was, okay, do something. You know, make something. Make something better. Make something useful. So what we've got is also, we have also launched a company that's, uh, that's making uh, gas generators, which are half a megawatt and up. Which, so these are fairly large generators. And desalination, or we're making water pure, is really about energy. It's not about the water. It's sort of energy, then water, then food, you know, without which nothing else works. And the time is coming when billion people are going to die because there's no water. The rich people will just move. Poor people will just die. And there's not much going on there. So we are investing in that area. We've already gotten to the point where everybody keeps hounding me from all over the world saying, can we come? Can we come? I said, no, no. Let me get it done, and then we'll call you. The country is calling us. Um, so the one thing that I want to do is if, if you're doing charity and you're not serious charity, large scale, and you're not doing water, the rest is nonsense. Because if they're dead, you can't really help them after that. So that's some of the areas. And the other area we're working on, which is also really large, is um, we have a medical device that we're doing in Singapore uh, that is going to affect overall health in a way probably last 50 years nothing has helped. It's a simple device that affects circulation. So it increases circulation, and that'll affect almost, you know, 80% of all major diseases in a very significant way. You actually feel better. Uh, the reason nobody else came up with it, the funny part is the technology was around for 25 years, and nobody knew what to use it for. And it was too simple. Uh, and science guys do not like simple. 
because you can't write a paper, you can't get acknowledged by your peers. None of that happens if it's simple. So somebody's got to do the simple stuff. So this is what we do. So in these areas, we're going to, these, uh, these three, bus they're businesses, but they're also really, in the end, uh, for nonprofit, because the people who will gain from it will be nonprofit. And we'll probably end up making a bunch of money, too, uh, which then we'll go back uh, and, and, and um, you know, donate it again. So each of these businesses will be, you know, look to be at least several times the size of Five Hour. So, and you guys should really know this well. Every time I come to Silicon Valley, you know, everybody talks in terms of billions. There's no millions here. There's only billions. Uh, and at first I thought, wow, that's really impressive. Until I find out they weren't talking about profit and they weren't talking about revenue. So I said, what, what are you guys talking about then? And it was, uh, okay, we just make up numbers as to what something is worth, and we uh, discuss it, and we have a valuation. I thought, wow, what a way to run a business. You know, I, I live in the Midwest. Uh, for us, a business is something that makes a profit. Uh, we sort of, in our company, when we discuss sizes of business, it's a billion dollar business, that means net income, not, not a greater fool theory, like, okay, we'll build this thing that makes no money, has no sales, and we'll sell it to some idiot who's gonna pay us a billion dollars. <laughs> That's a great strategy, but I wouldn't call it business, at least not wherever I'm from. Uh, here, it seems to be the, the, the norm, um, which is really interesting. I mean, uh, you know, you, you do a whole bunch of stuff like this. It's sort of like what we used to call gambling. Uh, <laughs> But here it's called business. So very interesting. Um, I don't think I want to learn from you guys. Uh, so I think we'll go to the same old stuff and say, okay, uh, we're, look, we're just gonna make good old stuff that's useful. Um, and and uh, some of the things are, I'll tell you how we work in our company. You know, again, we don't have MBA speak. So if somebody comes to me with a project or something needs to be done, and I, the first question I ask is, is it useful? How is it useful? Okay? And if it's not useful, it better be entertaining. <laughs> and if it's not useful or entertaining, there's only one other basket left, and that's useless. <laughs> okay? Now, so uh, to us, uh, business is really not rocket science. It's just do useful stuff, guys. Uh, and avoid useless. I mean, you came here, you did all this, was it useful? I have my feeling it wasn't that entertaining. <laughs> so it, it really, it, it, it's just simple stuff. If it, we're sort of students of simple rather than, our, my job I think is to make complex simple, whereas it seems a consul consultant's job is to make simple complicated. Uh, we, <laughs> we use some experts and consultants sometime, and usually when a science guy says it can't be done, to me that's validation that it can. Uh, so it, 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 it's a different, because you, you, I mean, we define stuff, like expert. What's an expert? Expert is something, someone who knows everything that was. He's really good at what was. And if you ask him about what will be, he says, no, no, that can't be done, because I'm an expert on what was. <laughs> well, why do I need you? Because if I wanted to do what was, I don't have a business. So, you know, we, we look at, we do talk to experts to just make sure that maybe they've thought of something or the history of the, that area is something that we haven't thought of, but we really don't rely on them for the future because that's just silly, you yeah. know. So we, we, anyway, that's our approach to uh, 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 business. Uh, everything is really, really simple. And again, uh, people ask me about marketing. Um, and I, I gotta tell you some, some other simple philosophies that we have. We have what I call, when I, when I hire somebody or, or uh, that's gonna join our firm, um, we have uh, what's called the prime directive, which is if any of you have ever seen Star Trek, there's a prime directive. And the prime directive in our company is no aggravation. Okay, nobody gets to give us aggravation. Whether it's customers, vendors, employees. If you aggravate, you gotta go. It's that simple. Because 
And it's really business, because usually it's the 1%. You know, some customer that's got 1% of your business, and he's driving you nuts. And he's taking up 80% of your head. How is that business? So aggravation is the largest cost in business. To me, it's really simple. Uh, we live here at the work. If an employee is such that they're going to cause all kinds of havoc, that they're going to aggravate, we need to go. One time, uh, one of our senior guys yelled at a receptionist. So I called him in. I said, look, you can't yell at her. You can fire her. If she's that bad, they need to go. But we live here. Don't mess up this, air, this place. And we, I've found that aggravation is, if you avoid it, not only do you have fun, but it is, it's a great place to work, and nobody quits. I mean, we can't get people to quit. <laughs> uh, we have basically, I mean, out of those 70 people, I think I, we lose about one a year. And, and it's to a non-job. You know, it's like, okay, they're, they don't want to work anymore. They're going to three days a week. or We have almost no turnover because there's no aggravation there. So there's huge benefits come from a simple uh, concept. Um, lots of concepts that we do are different. Somebody asked me, I think we were just having an interview, uh, and somebody asked me, well, should we have risk takers? You know, entrepreneurs, risk takers. And I said, no, 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 no. Entrepreneurs are not risk takers. You know, if, 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 I, if I, somebody in my company wants to take risks, I say, oh, no, no, go work somewhere else. You know, our job as entrepreneurs is to minimize risk, to manage risk, to give it to somebody else. Not take it. If you want to take risk, go to Vegas. <laughs> you know, it, it's a really simple concept. But if you tell people you should be risk takers, they go out there and just blow your money. I mean, that's, it's really dumb. Yeah. And again, like I said, you know, our other pr uh, principle is please don't do dumb. Um, it, it, we have, I mean, we have our own jargon to some extent. Like, for example, somebody comes to me the project or a product that we're going to go sell, or, or, or some some project. I ask them, "Is it slam dunk?" You know, and, and no, it's really good. I said, "No, no, is it slam dunk?" So, but but it really, it's a good product, and what it does is it totally clarifies their mind that. Oh, no, it's not slam dunk. Then, then I say, well, why are we going to do it? So our standards are high. We have these simple things which, which uh, clarify the mind, not totally you know, mess up your mind, or have so much jargon that nobody knows what you're talking about, but you got all the right words, like eco ecosystem, whatever. Uh, you know, everybody's got an ecosystems here, you know, or, uh, you know, Value propositions. No, 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 guys, just good, sell good stuff to people who need it. You know? uh, so I, all of that jargon, all it does is bury common sense. Uh, so the idea is you get simple. Uh, somebody asked me you know, in the interview, I said, what, what does an entrepreneur really need? So I said, they only need two things, common sense and a sense of urgency. That's it. And they asked me, who, do, who should we learn this stuff for? And my answer was, from your mom. Because she's probably done more management than your MBA professor. <laughs> you know. Because she's got a budget, she's got all these kids running around, hard to manage. All of this thing has to be done every day, seven days a week. Now that's work, that's hard work, that's learning on the job. And people say, well, if you're just a homemaker, that's, a, that's like a lowly thing. No, it's not. That's, the, that's great media, and people say, oh, no, you know, you're, you're, you're saying, well, women should be homemakers. No, no, that's the, most, that's the hardest work there is. It's the most talent you need. Us, uh, the guys go out there and work eight hours. That, any idiot can do that. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's sort of thinking based on description. In other words, if you look at any word and you really think about it, then you understand it. Otherwise, you just use these words that everybody uses, and, and they think, OK, now this guy must know something. After all, he, he, you know, he knows what an ecosystem is. So uh, <laughs> our approach to things, like I said, is, is different. You may agree with it. I'm sure I'm going to get some MBA professor to, I mean, one time the U of M, uh, University of Michigan Ross School, called me 
to speak. I said, are you guys kidding? <laughs> so I said, I, you know, I think of MBAs, I think it's totally useless. Um, so he said, no, no, come over. So, so I said, fine, that's what you want. <laughs> so I went over there and kind of defined it. I said, look, I mean, I'm not saying that they don't teach anything of value. I mean, I think they teach this much that is useful. And then teach this much that is useless. And then they teach this much that's harmful. <laughs> yeah. So overall, you know, averages on the useless side. Uh, because you come out of school and you actually think you know something? <laughs> really? You know, and that's dangerous because you really don't. So uh, I never hire people out of fancy schools for that reason. My first question usually is to an MBA, how are you gonna get over it? <laughs> so, and I'm not, I'm, I'm really not alone in this. The good guys I've met, the chief executives I've met of really large companies that are, you know, that don't, usually they get in front of the podium and it's all PC, lawyer, you know, lawyer cleared stuff, so they don't say anything. But the good guys that I've met, they're all sick of MBAs, really. Uh, they're not really enamored of this whole thing because, you know, look, it's a simple thing. If you're gonna learn plumbing, go learn from a plumber that's actually seen a pipe. You know, has fixed a leak. Not just written about pipes and lectured on pipes and research pipes. Yeah. It's, it's, so I, I, I'm not for theoretical plumbers. Uh, so our approach, uh, like I said, is, is, is really very straightforward. Um, let me see what else. Again, there, there are some other words, for example, that are poorly defined out there. I mean, I listen to people sometimes on TV and it, you know, sometimes between crying and laughing, it's difficult to figure out which one to do. Uh, you know, they say all, all companies should innovate. And none of these fellows know how to, to define the word. You know, what is innovation? There are three things that I looked at. There's technology, there's invention, there's innovation, okay? And people use those interchangeably when it's nonsense. A technology, to give you an example, is like, a, uh, you know, and those guys who came up with lasers. That was 50 years or 60 years ago. Now, laser is a technology, it's not really an invention yet. When you use the laser in a way that's useful, that's an invention. You make a product that says, okay, this is useful to these people. That's an invention. And innovation is just simply something useful that you didn't do yesterday that you're gonna do today. It could be a process, it could be a product. If you don't clarify in this, this in your head, you're gonna be in trouble. Because, you know, it's, it's, there are so many things that about innovation, about new products that, uh, or research. Take research, for example. Somehow, Wall Street fellows are so enamored of companies that spend 5% of their sales on research versus 3%. What, is this brains by the pound? You know, it, it's, it's not about the money. Good stuff doesn't come for money. And history tells us that, and we still chase it. Mobs of PhDs do not come up with great inventions. It's a couple of guys in a garage that have proven that that's not true. And it's usually a couple of people. Throughout history, it's only been a couple of people have come out with the greatest of stuff. And yet we insist that if we have 1,000 PhDs instead of 500, we're gonna do it better. It makes no sense. You know, it's like a corporation, you know, it's, uh, people in corporations are smart. However, when you put them all together, everybody knows a mob is stupid. So if you put a whole lot of smart people together, they act like a mob. They can't get it together. They're all worried about, okay, what, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen people do stuff we all have. Like, okay, my, but my carpet is smaller than the other guys. Really, that's what's gonna make this company successful or just nominal things which, you know, posturing internally, all of that stuff happens. And it's really the management's fault, of course. You know, I would say almost everything that happens in a corporation, it's the management's fault. 
It's always the management's fault. They motivate you one way. For example, you know, in the sales, sales side, you know, they say, well, we're going to give you commission. OK. So I sell everything I can, whether the company makes money or not. Now, whose fault is that? The management's. So, and then the next year, I say, well, you know, you sold $100 worth, you got $10. Now, next year, you sold $100 worth, I'm only giving you eight. Now, even though he knows that the company made money on the $100. So the guy's looking at it and says, OK, so you're going to rip me off. OK, fine. Now that the rules are clear, I'm going to game the system. So it's really the management's fault that's, that sets it up in a way that, that's really terrible. Um, there's so many things that people look at that are just so messed up. Uh, for example, our hiring of sales guys. Uh, all of them are over 50. Now there's one guy at 48, but all of them pretty much are over 50. Why? I don't like officers. I like sergeants. Officers write memos. Sergeants execute. If you shoot all the officers today in the Army, the Army will still run for a while. You shoot all the sergeants, it stops right now. So what we do is say, we get guys that are sergeants who've been there, done that, and people say, well, you know, they don't have the energy. But maybe they don't need the energy. They can do with their little finger what five 30-year-olds can do, taking them all day. And what corporate America says is, well, no, we can just take six weeks and just teach you that. Some kid. Nah, never going to happen. I got guys, I got 18 guys that sell the whole country while our competitors have 300. Now, these guys are pros. They know what they're doing. They don't make mistakes. And they love their job. We don't even pay that much. And there's a line out the door for people wanting to come and work for us at less money. Because we give them respect. And we say, OK, you, know, uh, you do it. And one time, we were putting too many, um, I'm not sure what 433, am I over time or under time? I'm over. OK. OK. Yeah, I better end this. Um, <laughs> you know, I, manage, I can't read. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's, I think there was going to be some question and answer that you may want or not, which uh, um, uh, I'm not sure that, again, this was useful. But uh, from all your laughing, I assume it was entertaining. <laughs>